Genetic pioneers like Carl Correns and Niels Heribert Nilsson repeatedly emphasized that selection alone doesn't create something new. It only acts as a filter, like a sieve. Just as a sieve doesn't create new tea leaves, selection doesn't create new forms of life or new species. Natural selection is a real process, and it works well for explaining certain limited kinds of variation, small-scale change. We have lots of examples of that, in fact. Where it doesn't work well is explaining what Darwin thought it could, namely the real complexity of life. We have the finch beak, and then you've got the finch itself. A minor change in the structure of the beak, versus the origin itself. These are different scales of phenomena. These are different kinds of problems. And the important problem for biology is to understand where natural selection works and where it doesn't and why there's a difference. Evolutionist Roger Lewin has a much more credible take on this subject. Natural selection as the central characteristic of neo-Darwinism can have a stabilizing effect but does not provide the creation of new species. It is not the creative force that many have suggested. A famous evolutionist, the English paleontologist Colin Patterson, admitted this when he said, No one has ever produced a species by mechanisms of natural selection. No one has ever got near it. And most of the current argument in neo-Darwinism is about this question. When it was clear that the mechanism of natural selection proposed by Darwin had no evolutionary power. Evolutionists had to make a fundamental change in the theory. In addition to the concept of natural selection, they added a second mechanism called mutation. Mutations are alterations or distortions that take place in the DNA of living beings, mostly as a result of external effects such as radiation or chemical action. The theory of evolution now holds that living things are differentiated from one another and develop as a result of mutations. One of the best known examples of a mutation affecting morphology is the four-winged fruit fly. In opening a biology text, um, one will often see a picture of a four-winged fruit fly. Now as we know, ordinary fruit flies have only two wings. The four-winged fruit fly has not only its regular set of wings, but a second set of wings just next to that. And the caption or the text will say, this is evidence for um, the process of evolution, that mutations affect the process of development and you can get anomalies as interesting as a four-winged fruit fly. Well, it turns out that the four-winged fruit fly is actually a very poor example of Darwinian evolution, certainly. There are no muscles attached to it, so the second set of wings is effectively dead. Uh, the fly is a hopeless cripple. It's kind of like having a small plane with an extra pair of wings tied to its tail. The fly can only survive in the laboratory, uh, and it would be selected out by natural selection in the wild. So it's not uh, a step forward in evolution. It's an evolutionary dead end. And it turns out that all morphological mutations that we know of are either have no effect on the organism at all, no, no fitness effect, or they're harmful. Mutations are they can bring about small adjustments in a particular species, but no way are they able to change one kind of creature into another. What about mutations? and other genetic alterations are cited as the mechanisms used by evolution to add genetic information. Problem, they don't, okay? Mutations lead to a loss of genetic information. All examples of mutations are actually loss of information, even the favorable ones. There is no new genetic information. Claimed examples of evolution in action are actually examples of variation within a kind. Antibiotic resistance, insecticide resistance, uh, peppered moths, all these are examples of rearrangement of existing genetic information or loss of genetic information. There's no new genetic information. So clearly, if you accept that DNA model, that DNA is responsible for coding in some way all the characteristics of an organism, whether it's recipe or it's blueprint, then obviously 
you've got the basis of a theory of evolution, a scientific theory. Changes in the DNA produces changes in the organisms, etc. Everything flows from there. Uh, and yet, an unknown secret here, that neo-Darwinian paradigm has been known to be false, unquestionably false, irrefutably false, for over 50 years. I'd say the decisive year when the evidence became overwhelming was 1954, uh, when a guy called Tracy Sonneborn published his final paper in his research after about 20 years of research. The information required for large-scale evolution can really not come from random mutations. Uh, the Darwinian model says that it does, but nobody has ever made a calculation to show that it does. I've made a calculation that shows that it doesn't. It's uh, very improbable that uh, there can be many small steps of evolution, many small changes adding up to one large change. And not only is it improbable on the mathematical level, that is theoretically, but experimentally one has not found a single mutation that one can point at that actually adds information. In fact, every beneficial mutation that I have seen reduces the information, it loses information. Can you give an example of a genetic mutation or, or, or an evolutionary process which ha can be seen to increase the information in the genome? 